Some, um, some months ago, weather had warmed up, and one of, our, one of our four perfect grandchildren was having a birthday party, and it involved bicycles. And so my wife and I, we, we brought our bikes, and so we did, did, did the bike thing. Now, when you, get, when you haven't been on a bike for decades, the big goal is to stay on the bike. Are, are you with me here? It's just stay on it. And we've managed to mostly do that. But we got home that evening, and both of us were feeling funny. It's the best way I know how to put it. We just felt funny. Things that just muscular types of, skeletal types of, and then we realized we're old. <laughs> now, I'm old. She's not. She'll never be old, all right? But we, 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 we realized some season has changed. You with me? The season for kids and grandkids, but it's time for maybe the grands just to say, go! But we had not really been aware that there had been a shift. Something, something had, had changed. And, you know, Daniel chapter 221, it says that God changes times and seasons. David referenced living his best life, you know, in 2018 when, you know, some stupid prophet guy gives him a word that turns his life upside down and that the season of comfort, quote unquote, had shifted for David and for his family. Jesus, to his followers, to his listeners in Matthew 16, he says, you know, you guys can figure out the weather in the evening, in the morning, but you don't know how to interpret the signs of the times. It goes on in Luke 19, and it talks about missing the day of salvation. For us to be able to fully not only recognize, but receive that which God is doing, we have to have revelation of that moment that we've been placed in. And many times, those things that God is doing in the Spirit, by the Spirit, initially, they elude our natural senses. This is why when Jesus was speaking in Matthew 16, he said, you know, you can look at the sky, you can figure out what the weather's about to do, and that's a great thing. But you still can't interpret the times of what God is doing. And what I want to do this morning is something I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life, is to be sure that God's people, the church, don't miss the moment that God has placed them. It's critical. Because if we don't know that, the same way that if you don't know what the weather is doing, and in Denver it changes every hour, I mean, you go from rain to hail to snow to tornadoes to hurricanes to frogs falling out of the sky. Your weather is freaking biblical here. And so you have to, but, but there's a measure of preparation. Are you with me? An understanding of where we live and what's happening in this moment. When I was with you last time, last year, I spoke a message entitled, Running in the Rain, that we are in the first cloudbursts of global revival. Here we are. And that revival is both a sporadic and an ongoing expression of Pentecost. Now that seems like a contradiction of terms. It's not. It's both sporadic and ongoing. If you go back to the book of Acts, the second chapter, and you see God pouring out His Spirit in a wholesale way, what we find, it was in that moment that God birthed something called the church. And where God moved from, 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 from His, if you wish, affection, attention, even how He was making covenant, that it shifted now to this to this entity known as the Bride of Christ. 
His people, the church. But we need to understand the revival, the moment that we're living in. And it's about increasing moments of God pouring out His Spirit upon us. Not so we can just go, woo, woo, this is nice. It's like kids in a, in a spray ground. You ever seen kids at a spray? I mean, they just, oh, this is having the most fun. You know, woo, spray, and they're just, you know, pouring water on one another. Sadly, that's a picture of what many segments of the church look like. The rain comes, and all we know how to do is play in the rain. Where what God has intended for us is for that rain to go into vessels that can in turn transmit and transfer that rain and that river of revival back into our campuses, our communities, back into our cities, and ultimately back into the nations. This is what God's intending to do. But it begs a question, is there a place for that rain to go? Is, are there vessels that are prepared, created, expectant that God's about to do something? How many people come into a meeting just like this? A testimony that we heard this morning of just in a moment of greeting where everybody else is just kind of going through the motions. You know, that, that two and a half minutes of greeting somebody, an introvert's nightmare. I don't want to meet anybody. But this dear lady, her life was forever altered in that moment. And we never quite know sometimes. And you sit in a room like this, and there are people, and all of a sudden, God fills them. They get it for the first time. Other people are just like, is it lunch yet? And you can be sitting in the same room, same worship, same sermon. What's the difference? It's the vessel is what makes the difference. It's not what's coming from the front. It's not what God is pouring out. It's the measure of expectation and anticipation and preparation. Here we are. And we're in a moment of this revival. And I want to speak this morning about being vessels of revival. And I want to look at three things. I want to look at jars. I want to look at cups. And I want to look at bowls. All of these biblical examples. The first, I want to look at jars. Second Kings, the fourth chapter, and those of you that have ever been around me for a moment know that I cannot preach a message and not reference Second Kings. Only because I can make Second Kings say anything I want it to say. But there's a story in the, the first few verses, verses 1 through 7. And it's the widow of a prophet. Obviously, the prophet was not a really good money manager. Left her destitute. And in those days, you didn't get to file chapter 7, 9, 11, 13, 17, whatever prime number is out there. They just came and they got your kids and they sold them into slavery to satisfy the debt. I mean, this is a fairly critical moment as you can imagine. And the prophet asked her a question, what do you have in your house? Well, I don't have anything. Well, except a little oil. And then the prophet gives her some instructions. Go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Now watch this. And don't ask for just a few. Now, right there, we get a foreshadowing of what God is about to do. Don't ask for just a few. How many times as individuals, as believers, we get jammed up, and all we're looking for is to get the rent paid this month. All we're looking for is just to get this short-term need met. And yet, in this moment, God had something that was going to not just 
get this woman through a moment of crisis. But he was about to move in such a way that was going to set her up for the rest of her life. Don't ask for just a few. Let me just tell you. Ask of me, God says. And not just, I will give you your neighbor for your inheritance. Ask of me, and I will give you the what? The nations. I got to tell you, I've been having walked with God now for almost 50 years. I can tell you that most of the time, the limitation has not been on God. It's been on me. Not bringing the requisite containers of expectation and faith to that which he was about to do. Oh, my. Then he says, then go inside, shut the door behind you and your sons, and start pouring out your little oil. How many times do we begin to assess our own lives and say, I ain't got nothing. I can't preach like Pastor David. I, I can't do worship like these folk. I'm not an evangelist. I'm not X, Y, and Z. And so we, we begin to look on our shelves and we begin to take a spiritual inventory and then we begin saying, well, I just did, ain't much in the house. Let me just tell you, God's never afraid of how little. The only issue is the willingness for us to pour out that which we have. That becomes the only issue at hand. And so she begins to pour, and that's, it's only when she begins to pour that what happens? The miracle ensued. How many of us, we want the miracle to start before we pour out? We want God to show up and fill our bank accounts. We want God to show up, and before we open our mouths and give somebody a word from heaven, we want God to give us the entire paragraph and the, the whole book. When many times God says, no. I want you to begin to give that which you have, that you don't see it yet. I want you to open your mouth and watch me fill it. The disciples asked Jesus, tell us what to say. He said, just show up and I'll put the words in your mouth. Just get there. My goodness. And you know the story. As long as there were empty vessels, oil flowed. When they got full, the oil stopped. And what was the admonition? At that point, it was sell the oil, satisfy your debts. Watch this. And you and your sons can do what? Live on the rest. Do you realize this woman moved from being in debt to wealthy? One act moved her. She was just looking to get out of the moment that it jammed her up. But God set her up for the rest of her life. And as great as this story is, do you realize that if her sons had gone and gone further out and gotten more containers, the oil would still be flowing today if there had been a place for it to flow. And rather than the miracle affecting just this woman and her household, it could have affected an entire city. Amazing. On the basis of what? Foresight. On the basis of empty vessels. My goodness. And you and I are not just, we're, we're not just called to show up on Sundays and just get filled. God is looking, bring empty vessels to be filled. This is the key. We move over to the New Testament. And we find the first miracle of Jesus. Everybody say, ooh, 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 I got that one. I got that one. Water into wine. Yay! I'm a biblical scholar now. But we find the story over in John 2. And it said that as Jesus' mother had come to him and said, they need wine. Woman, it ain't my time yet. Boy, I don't care about your time. They need wine. And I'm telling you, it's time for wine now. But watch this. John 2, 6. Nearby stood six stone water jars. 
the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. My wife and I, I'm sure some of you have been to Israel, and you see these jars of antiquity. They, they stand about this tall, cylindrical. And you can imagine that Jesus is looking around, and he sees these, he sees these jars. Somebody was counting. There were six of them. Now, who knows if what the, what the actual genesis of all of this was, but do you realize there would have been no miracle without an available vessel? Jesus said, go fill them up. But if there had been no place to go put the water, are you with me? then there would have been no water to have turned into wine, and as a result, there would have been no what? Miracle at Cana. What did it begin with? Empty, available jars. Many times we don't give the jars enough credit. But it was the availability of those jars that set the entire thing in motion. Two chapters later, John 4, another woman, another container. The woman at the well. Everything culturally wrong with this encounter with Jesus and this woman. First of all, he is, here's a Jew speaking with a Gentile. Secondly, here's a man speaking to a woman. Secondly, she's not even there at the right time of day. Water was drawn early in the morning. This is midday. What was she doing there? There's so all kinds of theories. Maybe she was trying to pick up another man. Maybe that she just need, didn't need the hassle of her neighbors. And so she went when there were fewer people there. But everything was wrong about this particular setting. And Jesus' disciples are watching from a distance. What's he? He's talking to this woman. Man, she's, she can't, he can't, he, oh, that's wrong. He shouldn't be doing that. And they begin to have this encounter, and she begins to discuss, you know, worship and theology with Jesus. Bad idea. Don't discuss theology with God. You will lose. Jesus simply asked her for a drink. And then... He says, I see that he, Jesus begins to talk to her and begins to prophesy to her. I, that, that I see that you've had many husbands, and the man that you're living with now is not your husband. Now, that's a pretty good word of knowledge right there. And she comes back and says, I perceive that thou was a prophet. You think? And then on the basis of that encounter, it says she left her jar. She went back into her community, and she said, come see a man. You see, she came with a natural jar. She left being a spiritual jar. She came looking for something in the natural. Jesus gave her something far away and beyond what she could even imagine. Have you ever looked in and been shopping at Amazon and you kind of just get out there and say, oh, I didn't know they made that. I need that. Come on. Or be in a store somewhere and you say, oh, I didn't know that. I need that now. I didn't know it existed until 10 seconds ago, but now I have to have it. She didn't even know there was anything called living water. But once Jesus introduced her to it, it's like, I want that. And yet this woman now, all of her natural needs became secondary. She didn't leave with her full water jar. She left her jar behind her. But she moved now from going to a well to being a well. She moved from just bringing a container to being a container for the things that God had poured into her life. And talk about the most unlikely individual for God to move through. It would have been this woman. Multiple marriages, adulterer, fornicator, culturally wrong, 
outside, not inside. Yet this is a woman that affected her entire community. Here it is right here. Jars. Amazing. And the question for you and I is what about our jars? 2 Corinthians 4 says we have this treasure where? In jars of clay. Clay jars were those that were not porcelain. They weren't pottery necessarily. They were pretty ordinary vessels, common but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is not from God. It's from God and not from us. It's not about a perfect jar. It's about an available jar. It's about an empty jar. You come this morning and say, Pastor Jim, I'm empty. I have nothing. Congratulations. You're in the right place at the right time. This is it. Maybe you've been in an extended season of dryness. Congratulations. God's about to fill you in a brand new way. And let me say this to you before we go to our second point. It's a great therapeutic emphasis in the church of get me right. Get me whole. The cracks in my life, Jesus, come and listen. God is, he, he's vitally vested and invested in your health. He really is. But could I change your orientation just for a moment? Most of the time, we want to get whole so that we can feel better about us. Could I submit to you the real issue about us getting whole is to fix the cracks in our jars so that what God wants to pour out can be contained. Let me tell you, that changes the motivation of us getting healed, us getting healthy. It moves it from a completely anthrocentric, narcissistic orientation of God, me, 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 to God, fix the cracks in my life that I can hold more of you and in turn pour out more of you. In the places where you've called me. Let me tell you, you want to get whole, you want to get healthy, change the center of the reason that you want to get that way. Please don't hear the wrong thing. Jesus cares about your hurt. I care about your hurt. But let me just tell you, that alone isn't enough. But when we change that orientation, that I don't want to be leaky anymore. I want to hold everything that God wants to pour out that he wants me to contain. Everybody got that point? Let me give you a second. They're cups. We see numerous references in Scripture about cups, but usually they're one or two pictures. The first that I want to talk to is the cup of the new covenant. Luke 22, Jesus is there at the Passover meal. And he passes around a cup. It's one of multiple cups that were used in this ceremony. But he holds that cup up. He says, this is the cup of the new covenant. It is my blood shed for you. And how oft you shall drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. You see, God is always related to his people on the basis of covenant. That's a word that, quite frankly, in 2024 means very, very little anymore. Covenants have more to do with something you have to sign when you move into your condo. We talk about marriage covenants, but they don't mean that much anymore either, sadly. But God is always related to his people on the basis of covenant. Prior to this one, there was an old covenant. It was based on rules. And that we were held righteous based on our ability to keep all of those rules. And God came and he said, I'm going to bring you now into a better covenant, a new covenant that doesn't abolish the old one. It completely, perfectly fulfills it. Aren't you glad of that? Man, I'm so glad I don't have to keep up with 600 and some odd points of the law and that my righteousness is not on the basis of, of getting it all right. Hallelujah. 
Hand that cup over, baby. I'll drink that all day long. But there's this cup, and we receive it when we receive communion together. This is what this cup reminds us of. But there's another cup, and we don't talk about this one because it's not nearly as redemptive, if you wish. But there's a cup of iniquity that the Bible speaks of. Now, how many of you know we serve a long-suffering, patient God? If we didn't, none of us would be here this morning. Thank you. Smile when you say that. He loves you. But let me also say to you, there comes a moment. There comes a moment. Come on, parents. Boy, you just found my last nerve. And mom and dad, you'll put up with a lot for a long time. Come on, right? But there comes that moment, <clears throat> usually somewhere in the afternoon when mom is sleep deprived. You with me? And little, little Bubba finds that last nerve and just starts jumping up and down on it. And all of a sudden, that long suffering and that patience it comes to an unsanctified close right there. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Now, we're human, and we know what it's like to get to that place. But we have this idea that God never gets there. I want to submit to you it's not completely accurate. There comes a moment when there's a principle of sowing and reaping and the filling of a cup that can no longer contain any more, it spills over. Romans 2, because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when it says that the righteous judgment will be revealed. Revelation chapter 18 talks about a cup as well. One commentator said this, a divine restraint is not a bottomless well. There is a limit to his forbearance. And I want to say something to you. If I had a cup up here this morning and it was completely full and I continued to pour into that cup, at some point, what's in that cup, what would happen? It would come out. And that would be if I did nothing to the cup. I didn't shake it. I didn't jar it. I didn't tilt it. It's just a matter that the cup has now done what? It is full. And now it is going to do what? It's coming over. I want to say to you, and hear me prophetically, we have come to a moment. We're already seeing it in the context of the church. But we're seeing it as well now in cultures and in nations where there are cups of iniquity that are full and they are spilling over. I want you to hear me. This, isn't, this doesn't negate the outpouring of the reign of revival. This doesn't negate anything I said in my first point. It says that they're happening at the same time. And it can get to be very confusing for us. Hear me. And we look sometimes and we say, well, I, that's not my understanding of God. And we look at some biblical examples. By the way, when am I supposed to quit? Ten minutes ago? I got five minutes. All right, good. But we look at some biblical examples. We look at some, some folks like Nadab and Abihu. So you say, who are they? Aaron's boys. Moses' nephews. They're there at their ordination service. This is a big deal. And somehow these boys did something wrong, big time. And it says that in that moment, it says fire came out of the altar and killed them. Now talk about messing up a church service. I mean, even to the point that the anger of God was so kindled against these two kids that he said, he, he told Aaron, he told Daddy, don't even let me see it on your face. Not here, not now. My goodness. Uzzah, the Ark of the Covenant being toted on a cart, began to tilt over. 
Our man Uzzah just reached up to keep it from falling. God struck him dead. You ever read that and thought, man, that was harsh. Ananias and Sapphira, New Testament. They're there showing up and they're, they're bringing the proceeds of some sales and tithes and offerings. Is this what you got for the land? Yep. Boom. Dead. Bring the wife. Boom. <clears throat> dead. Again, how to mess up a giving moment in a church. And we look at these and we're thinking, my goodness, these are kind of over-the-top, kind of capricious acts of God. What? But what we don't see were the things that are not recorded. Uzzah, for instance, had an understanding of the ark. He'd been around it a long time. It wasn't just a moment. It was a, mo it was a moment of disdain and disgust. We have no idea, for instance, what Aaron's boys were up to, but it wasn't a one-time mistake that got them killed. Ananias and Sapphira, we don't know what else had been going on in their life. Scripture doesn't record it. It's like somebody, well, I got my driver's license suspended. For what? Parking ticket. Really? You lost your license over a parking ticket? Well, yeah, that and the two DUIs and the running around the school bus and the 47 unpaid parking tickets. And I did flip off an officer, too, by the way. So. But we don't talk about those. It's kind of like a kid. I got kicked out of school for chewing gum. Yeah, tell me about the first 59 demerits that you got there, friend. We don't talk about those. We talk about the last one. And this is how the cup of iniquity works. Yes, he's a long-suffering God, but let me just tell you, there's also a powerful principle of sowing and reaping. Oh, I love me some New Testament Jesus. I love, my, I love a New Testament God. Grace, mercy, love. Hate to be the one to tell you, he's the same God that travels from Old Testament right on into the New Testament. A man that I've had uh, just, just a moment to get to know, a man named R.T. Kendall written a few books, like 90 of them. And one of his last books is entitled, Is Your God Too Nice? That's literally the title of the book. Because we've created a narrative of who this God is. Are you with me? That we need to understand that he really is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the one that sustains life and he is the one that can end it at the same time. This is why, for instance... The political process has caused so much sturm und drang in our culture. It's why it doesn't concern me. Because at any moment that God doesn't want someone to serve, they won't be living anymore. And you might say, oh, that's harsh. It's God. It says he holds the hearts of kings in his hands like a water course. Don't kid yourself. Cups of iniquity. And then the last one are bowls. Bowls. Another 2 Kings story, 2 Kings, second chapter this time. Elisha comes up to this place. The townsfolk come and say, Look, this land is well situated, but the water's bad, therefore the land is unproductive. Now, we need to understand where this place is it's Jericho. If you look at antiquity, Jericho was one of the primary trade routes. It was almost like an oasis. But if you remember, it was also, Jericho was actually the first place that as God's people were coming into inheritance into the land of Cana, they ran straight into Jericho. And as you know, the walls fell, the trumpet, the marching, all of that stuff. But Joshua placed a curse on that place. And says, cursed is anybody that rebuilds a city. We find in Scripture that someone tried, cost them their kid. But here we are 500 years later, and this is the spot. And there's still an active curse on Jericho that Joshua had placed there 500 years prior. The prophet Elisha says, get me a new bowl and put salt in it. And he did it threw it in the water supply, the water was healed, and it says the land is healthy to this day. Listen to me. 
God is wanting you and I to be those bowls. Number one, those bowls that nothing else has been in. New bowls. But secondly, salt. Salt. What is something that Jesus called you and I? Salt of the earth. But he also talked about salt, that when salt loses its savor, it's what? It has no value except to be thrown, on, thrown, thrown under, uh, underfoot for traction. Do you know what causes salt to lose its saltiness or its savor? Is when it gets up next to something else and that salinity leaches out. Do you realize this is what happens when we get up next to the world? Is that many times, rather than our salt influencing the world, our saltiness is leached out as we get up next to the world. This is one of the great tragedy of the church is that we've lost our saltiness. Is we don't look very much different like anybody else. Because we've gotten so close to the world, and we've invented words for that, seeker-friendly, missional. I mean, we, we've got the right ecclesiastical language to use for it. But the reality is, we're not salty anymore. We're not salty. And first of all, we've got to recapture, we, we've got to recapture our salinity. But secondly, we've got to sow that salt back into our cities. How many of you know our land is under multiple curses? Hello? We're under a curse. Listen, if, if, if you're not convinced of that, the curse of abortion alone in our culture, that there is unrequited blood crying out from the ground in the United States alone, and it's released a curse. And the only way that curse gets released, it's not through legislative efforts to end abortion. Yes, that's a great place. But it's the role of the church to do the spiritual work to break the curses. And abortion is but one. I said, oh, you can't talk about that from Sunday morning. The church needs to start talking about that again. As uncomfortable though it may be. And we need to get that salt back out. And let me just tell you. God is pretty intent about getting the salt out of the shaker. And we can either willingly shake it, or God will happily grab our lives and shake it out. And I don't know about you, but I'd lost brother willingly. Say, okay, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll turn the salt loose, rather than God shaking the salt out through dealings. Amen? And there's one last bowl. We find it in the book of Revelation. It's a, book of, it's, it's a bowl of intercession. And it says that each one of these living creatures, they fell down, they're worshiping before God. It says each had a harp and they were holding golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. God showed me very, very clearly. He said, son, I'm about to tilt over those bowls of prayers. Some of you have been praying for things, months, years. Some of you, there have been generational prayers that are yet to be fulfilled, meaning prayers that have been prayed long before you ever burped the first time. Hear me. And those bowls are full, and God is about to tilt those bowls of intercession over Steve Merle said this years ago. He said, churches don't grow on the basis of prayer. They grow on the basis of answered prayer. Listen to me. And there are going to be prayers that we don't just do now as religious ritual, but we do because we believe God is a prayer answering God. And he's going to tilt those bowls over and those things that have been in delay, let me tell you, they're going to come upon you in an instant. What have I said? There's a pouring out. There's a rain coming. But the question for you and I is, into what 
or more especially, into whom? We are those vessels. Fragile? Yes. Jars of clay? Yes. Full of fissures and cracks? Yes. But God is wanting to make us whole that we can contain that which He's pouring out. There are concurrent cups of iniquity that are filling up and pouring over. Yes, there is an increase of evil, but yes, there's also an increase of righteousness coming concurrent. And they're bowls. Preserving salt to pour out and heal our communities, our campuses, our cities. And they're bowls of intercession. That God is saying yes and now to pray. Lord, let us hear something by your Spirit today. We can hear another sermon and say, that was interesting. Or we can hear it with spiritual ears. And let us be the latter. Doers, as James says, and not just hearers.